All right. Last time we were talking about stuff, we were talking about feudal Japan. And we're going to keep on kind of talking about from that. So we're looking at armors last time. But let's look on to our next thing here. We're going to make a bullet right down Zen Buddhism. So make a bullet right down Zen Buddhism. And Zen Buddhism, we talked about Buddhism kind of before. So what ends up happening is that Buddhism, Buddhism develops in India. That was developed by Siddhartha, who you guys are probably more familiar with his name being Buddha, which just means enlightened one. So he came up with this idea, this philosophy of Buddhism. It spread into China, then it went to Korea. So sorry, in India, went to China, then Korea, then comes over to Japan. And it mainly reinforces the Bushido values of mental and self-discipline. Go ahead and make one and write down, it reinforced the Bushido values of mental and self-discipline. So the code, way of the warrior, code of Bushido, people in Japan really like the aspects of Buddhism for the aspects that enforce the mental and self-discipline. And you can see also in the picture here on the right, uh, that's supposed to be the Buddha there. So that's the picture on the right, and that is for the Buddha. Okay. So what ends up then happening is we have the you know, Buddhism comes over to Japan, comes in Korea, so you see Korea right there on the map, kind of comes in this way. But next thing that kind of ends up happening that's in the 1200s that's important is the Mongolians. Go ahead and make a bullet and write down Mongolians invasions of Japan. So make a bullet and write down Mongolians invasion of Japan. All right. So in the 1200s, uh, Genghis Khan organizes the Mongol tribes, which uh, the Mongols, they live north of China. So organizes the Mongol tribes. The Mongol tribes then are united under one ruler. They extend their, they take over kind of the north part of China. And then they get out into the west areas. They get out to like the stand nations like Kazakhstan and so forth, kind of taking over those territories. And then eventually they end up conquering all of China kind of by 1274. Once China's kind of taken over and kind of all these western areas are taken over in Asia, the Mongolians decide that they want to invade Japan. And they make two different invasions of Japan, one time in 1274 and another time in 1281. So they make two different invasions of Japan. So for number one, we're going to write down attempted to invade Japan twice. So we're going to write that down for number one, attempted to invade Japan twice. So they attempt to invade Japan twice, as that once in 1274, once in 1281. And in both times that the, Jap the Mongolians attempt to invade Japan, is that the Mongolians, they got a whole bunch of like boats together and so forth, but the boats they got were river boats. They weren't ocean boats. Ocean, as you kind of know, if you've ever been to ocean, waves bigger in the ocean than in the river. Not really any, you know, waves on a river. Uh, that'd be kind of weird it was. But the boats that they had were just mainly river boats. They really weren't like ocean boats. So the boats that the Mongols were using transporting troops over just weren't really the best boats in the world. And in both times, what ends up happening, both 1274 and 1281, is the Mongolians, they're trying to invade into Japan. However, when they're trying to cross this area right here, they get hit by a giant windstorm that ends up capsizing like half their fleet. So like half the people end up drowning. And once those boats get kind of capsized, only half the people drown. By the time the other half gets to Japan, they end up losing in battle against the Japanese. Um, the Mongolians were very organized in battle. They would use like drums and so forth to kind of get their troops kind of organized. So they have drums and such just to kind of be like, hey, this drum beat means you do this. This drum beat means you do that. So a lot of organization and so forth through kind of that. So they're a very organized military force. That's not how the Japanese fought. The Japanese would fight instead in pretty much one-on-one -on -one combat. They, they wouldn't really engage in kind of these big group battles in which is like, hey, um, Swordsmen kind of here, pikemen over here, cavalry on the sides, and then you're trying to push, you know, at one time as an organized military force of attacking and then moving back and attacking and moving back. It's not what the Japanese did. They really just kind of found the opponent, fought on the one one battle, and then moved away. Since when the Mongolians landed, they were all kind of disorganized. And since they were used to fighting organized, with them being disorganized, the Japanese way of fighting in single combat worked pretty well and they defeated the mongolians both times when they landed as i said, mainly because they were hit by the giant windstorm that ends up kind of capsizing a lot of the boats and so forth 
What's this windstorm called? It's called the kamikaze. You may have heard this word before in terms of World War II, but this is for a different time. So make a two and write down kamikaze, two kamikaze. Now you're already familiar with the word kami and what that means. That means the word divine. So we talk about how kamis are like divine spirits. Okay. So kami is the first word. The second word kaze is wind. So when we say kamikaze, it just means a divine windstorm. That's all it really means. So it just means divine wind. So after we have two kamikaze, make equal sign and write down divine wind. So divine D-I-V-I-N-E and then wind, W-I-N-D. So divine wind. So divine wind, hit kind of these boats, these kind of river boats, capsizes them. A uh, lot of the Mongolians drown. They get into combat. Once they eventually do get over there, Japanese defeat them, push them back. And after the invasion of 1274 and 1281, at that point in time, the Mongolians decided to not try to invade again. And eventually the Mongolians kind of, their control over China kind of collapses in the early 1300s. All right. This right here just shows you a map of Japan and it shows you kind of the various towns that are in blue. So those are like the major towns in blues. The major castles are in red, so major castles in red. And major trade hubs are in yellow. Okay. So this kind of shows you a map of just kind of like the most important places kind of throughout Japan and such. And you'll kind of notice that there's like these little areas here. So you kind of see how there's like an area, area, area. It seems kind of where the dividing lines are. Those are just for various errant lords. We're kind of running stuff at. So those are the errant lords and such. So it says errant lords and such. Um, even though the north part of Japan was controlled by pretty much one group called Date. They kind of controlled up here in the north, but even though that's a pretty huge amount of land, the north part, unfortunately, there's not really a lot up there. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you have various groups that might control a huge amount of territory, but there wasn't like a whole bunch up there in the north that really made it, you know, very valuable. You know, the farmland wasn't as great. You really want good farmland, you know, you kind of need to be down here in this area. All right. I'm going to show you some pictures of some castles. Uh, this is ha Hajime Castle. So this is Hajime Castle. So you can kind of see the castle design here. So you have stone on the bottom. And then you have kind of the rest of it's made out of wood. Um, the plaster on it is fire resistant. It's not fireproof. It can catch on fire. But the plaster on it was particularly put onto it so that it would resist catching on fire. So it's not like you shoot an arrow on this and bam, all of a sudden it catches on fire. Uh, if it's an arrow, you know, that was on fire. Uh, instead, you would kind of shoot an arrow, it would hit into it, and it wouldn't light the entire building and structure unless there's a whole bunch of fire arrows at one location. Then, yeah, it would have enough heat to then catch it on fire. But the stone base and then wood on top. Why is the entire thing about a stone? Uh, not enough stone in Japan. Japan, remember, is smaller. It's like the size of California. So because it's like the size of California, just, they just didn't have access to a whole bunch of stone to build the entire thing out of stone. Same problem that we saw before with the iron armor. Uh, this is the main gate right here is Shima Castle. So this is just the gate of the castle. Again, you see stone on the bottom and then wood up top. Now, compared to our European castles, this is counter for a castle in Wales. So you can see how this castle is completely made out of stone. So it's in Europe and it's made completely out of stone. So in, stone, so in Europe, we'll see our castles completely made out of stone. As yes, we will see them completely made out of stone. We also see how our towers, you know, we get about 40 foot towers. We have walls that are about 20 foot tall. You look at Japan, you're not really seeing 20 foot high walls here. You know, you got like 15 or so ish. Uh, maybe, maybe this thing, you know, up top, you know, I can maybe go to 25 there and so forth, maybe 30, but it's not hitting the same heights as, you know, being able to completely make everything out of stone. I have another castle here to show you as well. So just like how Hiroshima Castle, we saw how that had kind of a moat. You can see right here, this is River Run Bodayam. In England, you can see how this is on like a little island, same thing as the Hiroshima castle on like a little island. So it's got all this water around it and then, you know, just straight up a castle there. So this kind of using the natural barriers to kind of defend an area. All right, let's go ahead and stop there for today.